I'm now selling this shirt. There's a link in the description below. Hi, my name is Sam Johnson and I'm a voice teacher. Today I'm here with my voice teacher from college and one of my good friends, Dr. Mark Reynolds. He is a voice teacher and an acting teacher and a stage director and kind of has his hands in a bunch of different pots. So I'm excited for you to hear what he has to share with you about all of those different pots. We're going to be reacting to and analyzing Dimash and his six octaves taking on the battle round with the world's best. Such a gentle voice. It is. Okay, what are you hearing so far with it? He started out so gentle, and then he has this immediate flip where he goes to such a connected, <laughs> full-sounding voice, and then just, like, melts our face off. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we're seeing here is really pretty awesome technique, and he kind of shows it all right now, right? The whole spectrum just goes bam of easy singing though. It's also really cool because we're seeing an operatic sound from like a mm. light jazz, like breathy sound to then a really high like Sam Smith poppy sound at the end. I mean, and it's so smooth. We don't even realize it's happening until bam, it's right there in our face, right? <laughs> and so, so it's really exciting to watch and to hear. And when I first heard it, I was like, oh, there's a breathy sound. Okay, it's just, can I be another breathy poppy moment and, and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but that contrast makes it super exciting as well right so the sound that he's getting out of himself would you consider that to be like an opera style sound or what's the difference between these yeah i, I you know i think one of the things that's really different here the beginning the shape he has in the back here is more horizontal oriented it's more like hat mm. or or something like that it's much more shallow it's more shallow it's it's still open and released and comfortable, but it's more shallow and it's more speech-like. It gives us that pop sound at the beginning. Then all of a sudden, when he switches into that different sound, that orients and we add a little bit of more height in the back that gets us the richness. He adds the consistent vibrato in it that makes it sound kind of operatic in nature. And he doesn't lose the, lose the forward placement, which I think is really important to note, but he does add this mm. a lot more space in the back. He doesn't get rid of this horizontal space, but he adds a lot of height to it which, and drops that jaw a little bit as well, which then gets us that richer, fuller sound. Then as he goes higher, he just loses some of the weight to it. Some mm. of that that openness and tallness, and you know, as we, if we were talking CT function, so meaning he's using vocal cords that are that are a little fuller, richer, and create heavier sounds. Eliminates that completely, goes straight to these higher sounds that lets him go into that counter tenor in opera land. He's singing in the counter tenor range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was up to the F. Yeah, yeah. So we're up in counter tenor land, singing these really pingy forward sounds, but still keeping some of that height and shape in the back. Yeah, another thing, the change in vowel 
you would not be able to get that full of a voice if you kept such a small vowel. Like, you wouldn't be able to go into full connected voice with such a shallow vowel that he used at the beginning. Otherwise, it would just be so compressed and feed back all of this tension and his whole body would kind of explode. So he's trusting that he needs to open up a little bit. When he gets up to that F to counter tenor land rather than just normal people tenor land, he opens it wider. There's a point where you have to just start opening it a little bit wider or else it won't work anymore. It's like those super high parts for guys around the F and above and for ladies about the eighth sharp and above. You just have to start breaking all of the rules that work well around your passaggio. <laughs> Yeah. Up to the... Then he switches over to classical female mode, where it just goes into that super hooty type sound compared to a second before, which was blaring and forward. Uh -huh. It's the same acoustic coupling that a classical soprano would use. So I think that you'd probably be able to hear that, seeing as you can hear classical sopranos pretty well. Yeah, so so, so that, that sound before this that was, was bright, that we started calling counter tenory land, was really more Sam Smith oriented. And then he switched back again to kind of a classical, really a counter tenor sound. That is so high. Just crazy counter tenor land. How rare is the ability for a guy to be able to get up that high? Do you find that that's something that anyone can do or is that something that needs a genetic link? You know, I'll, I'll be honest. It's not all that uncommon. There is a further extension up higher that operatic counter tenors have to have that I can't sing, right? There, there's a two week <laughs> session where I, I was considering singing counter tenor, but realized I just didn't have that upper extension I needed, right? <laughs> it just wasn't happening. Same. What's really interesting is you would think it'd be a higher, natural, higher speaking, tenory voice that would be able to get this sound. My experience has been it's actually the richer, fuller baritone type of voice that gets this type of sound a lot easier. So that kind of begs the question of what's the point in classifying someone as a baritone versus a tenor versus a counter tenor? And coming from the side of opera land where that actually does make a huge difference to where most of our viewers probably don't have that opera education. Right. Most of them are more into, you know, pop stuff. Right. And yet we use the same language across the board. Like what what is the point of the Fox system and do you think that it's usable? Yeah, so he just used the term Fox system. So for our viewers who aren't familiar with it, that is the, the classification system that we're talking about. You know, mezzo soprano, counter tenor, tenor, baritone, bass. And within those, there's even more classifications, right? There's lyric soprano, there's dramatic soprano, there's coloratura soprano. The real function in opera land is that it lets the directors and producers and artistic directors cast a show quickly. They can hear a hundred different auditions and cast them quickly and say that this role is best suited for this voice type. There's real problems with that. And even when we don't use this as the Fox system, when we're talking about tenor voices, say we say this is a high voice or this is a low voice. There's a singer that I've been listening to lately, Citizen Shade. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he has this really not, beefy no. low sound, really beefy, right? Um, and it's gorgeous. And then all of a sudden he pops up to the same ballpark that Sam Smith is. Same kind of sound, mm. right? Um, and it's shocking, just like this guy. And I think the real problem with classification in my mind is that it gets the singer into the wrong mindset. It gets them thinking, I can only sing this. This is a high note. I don't sing high notes. I don't sing an F. Um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can sing an F, right? It's just a very limiting mindset if you classify yourself too early. And I find that people in my voice studio and just all around are so quick to try to get classified. And they say, am I a tenor? Am I a baritone? I have no idea what I am. Yeah. Am I an alto? I sang alto in, in school all the time, so mm -hmm. I must be an alto. It doesn't matter until you're a really good singer, honestly. 
like I think that if you're not auditioning for opera, uh -huh. labeling yourself as a certain thing is almost more harmful than it is helpful. Yes, it's nice to know kind of what's easiest to sing if you're going to audition for a choir, because that's where you haven't expected I'm going to be spending a bunch of time in this range. Right. And but I mean, you could be a soprano and sing alto in choir. That happens all the time. All the time. Right? It's, they sight read really well, so we'll put them in the alto in this section, exactly. right? Yeah. And I'm with you. I think it can be really damaging. One of the reasons I like pop so much and rock is that it's more about what can you sing? What are the possibilities? Not just range of notes, but range of sounds and, and mm -hmm. expression that you can get without putting a label and judgment on it really fast and right away. It's a, can you make certain sounds that fit with this song that make me emotionally react, right? And to mm -hmm. me, I think that's, that's something that's really empowering. And I wish there was a little bit more of that freedom and flexibility in terms of in opera land that we have in, in pop music. There aren't, and it's more in my mind, a logistical money issue than it mm -hmm. is an artistic issue. Because if you, if you know what you are in opera land, you can learn four roles and have a career. Exactly. I think that Dimash is kind of just like a genetic freak. Being able to get above the C5, uh -huh. or no, getting above the C6 is so rare with pretty much anyone not going into gender or biological sex. It's just like getting that upper extension. And I've heard that he can go up there further. I mean, he claims to have six huh. octaves of range, right. of usable range, and that that really is kind of uncommon, hmm. but he is also using his voice in a way that allows that instrument to shine well. Right, and and I think that if if we took away the lessons and the and the things that he's doing, we would actually see more people be able to do that same thing. One thing that I think is really important to notice here from a performance standpoint that feeds with what we're doing voice voice wise. And the issue here is this sounds so powerful and it sounds so hard, like he has to be working so hard. He's making it look like it's so much effort, so much emotion behind it. But if you look really closely, that emotion is in what he's doing with his arms, his facial expression, his legs, and not what he's doing here in his voice and right around this area right here. Yeah, he's not engaging a bunch of extrinsic muscles. It's yeah, the big muscles are there for show, not for helping with the vocal production. Right. We are seeing some stuff starting to pop out here, especially at the very top there. You know, uh, I'm not sure anyone- I feel like that's inevitable and it's not an accurate way of discussing whether or not there's tension mm -hmm. because seeing that, that bulge that you see with almost anyone, if they have a low enough fat content, like it's just, it's going to happen. We're, we're gonna see a little bit there and it's quality of how much of it are we seeing and is that a result of negative or positive tension, right? And if you see other things starting to engage like crazy, or if you see the shoulders lock up with it, then or, that shows that maybe this isn't just a natural occurrence. Maybe it is something that we're putting on top of everything. And it's just a, a consequence of being, of singing too hard. Right. But with him, I don't think that's the case at all. Yeah. The other thing that I, I think is really cool as we notice is he's singing these super long phrases, right? We would think because he's, it sounds so powerful that he's throwing a bunch of air at it. He's not. He's using a teeny oh. tiny thread of air that he's just keeping super consistent that's letting him ride through these registers like nobody's business, right? Yeah. What's your favorite way to help someone find what it feels like to have a consistent airflow? Do you say <laughs> sing from your diaphragm? Do you like which what's your cliche? Yeah, <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great point. Diaphragm, I think, is really confusing. That's not my favorite one. Just personally, I, I find that we say diaphragm and we point to you know, our lower abdomen, which is would not where it is. So that gets confusing. To me, my favorite thing to do is to use the straw. You know, I love the straw. I love it. And to me, that's the easiest way to find the quantity of air, the speed of air. Yeah, baby. The quantity of air, the speed of air, and the consistency, and to be able to monitor that. How do you use the straw? Just for the people who have never played around with it. Yeah, so talking about straw has become very common in the last like five, six years. But uh -huh. before that, it seemed like no one was using it. Yeah. So for the viewers out there, if you want to come check it out, I have some of the videos on my site. I, I, I talk about some of those. I also uh, highly recommend Googling 
Uh, his name is Ingo Tietze. His name, if you spell it, it's I-N-G-O-T-I-T-Z-E. He's actually the voice scientist who really kind of championed the straw a long time ago, and that's where I picked it up from, and then it's it's gained more steam. He's got some cool videos. But if I was to quickly explain what we're doing with the straw, basically, we're blowing through this little stir straw. The stir straw is an important part, so go to a bar, go to an airport or restaurant. If you don't want to go and buy some, you can go on Amazon, <laughs> buy some. But it's the stir straw. That's because it has a smaller diameter. Yeah, it has a small diameter, which is the diameter that better reflects the airflow that we need going through that those vocal folds. The first step to me is just blowing through it and finding the balance. So we're getting the air going as fast as we can consistently through that straw without our cheeks really starting to bulge. We don't really want that bulge behind it and finding that balance. Then just start vocalizing through different notes trying to keep that same consistency. What I do is I hold the straw here and I put my hand in front of that straw so I can feel that airflow, see if I'm feeling pulses, any changes, any increase or decrease. And then once I get that consistent, I realize what that feels like. I can sing through a song with that that straw. You just vocalize underneath it like Yeah, totally like that. Sing through the song. And then I go through the song every other phrase, one with, one without. See if I can keep that sensation, that feeling the same. Another way that you can kind of use this, if you don't have the stirrer straw, you might have a bigger diameter straw, is to just put it in some water. Putting it underneath water adds added resistance, and it gives you a physical thing that you can check out to see if you're blowing too much air, or if it's not consistent at any part. Because then if the bubbles stop, then you know that your air is stopped. Or if the bubbles go crazy, you know that you're blasting a ton of extra air. So if you feel like you've always struggled with a straw, maybe go check that out. I think that it's too usable and it's too useful to not make a regular part of your practice routine. Totally agree. Any last thoughts, Mark? Yeah, if I was to share one last thought, I think it's easy to look at someone like this and try to find things to not like. Anytime we look at a performance, his costume's funky, you know, that's not natural, that's whatever. And what I would encourage you is anytime you're watching a performance where there's a little, little kid getting up, a grandma getting up, someone who sounds, <laughs> you know, your first reaction is, oh, please stop singing, is to first try <laughs> to find not what's going wrong, but the good things, right? And as I'm watching this, to me, I'm watching this and I'm just excited by it. You know, I, I there's not a whole lot that I have to go against this. I think it's a great show. It's exciting to watch. It's exciting to listen. But you know, I, I think when we're watching the average Joe, rather than getting in that critical mindset of finding the negative, get in a critical mindset of finding the positive and the things you can take away from that. And it just makes life so much better looking for that. But we all kind of get stuck in that of oh, yeah. being so overwhelmed by things that it's hard to see the silver lining. Completely. Lucky for us, Dimash makes that very easy to see the silver lining. Completely. Well, thank you again for coming on, Mark. It's been awesome having you here. And I am always thrilled about the conversations that we have and that we're able to share that with you guys. So please go check out Mark's channel. There is a link in this description and comment thanking him for coming on this one and subscribe to him so that you can see some of his awesome insight in the future. We do similar videos. We do different videos. Mark is a superhero and just his overall way of looking at the voice I think is so positive and individual driven rather than trying to make someone fit in a mold. So I think that that is well worth checking out. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Leave a comment below and also go check out Mark's videos and comment all over them. Thank you. And thanks for having me on, Sam. It's always a pleasure to be talking with you. And I'm excited that we get to share this with your viewers and mine.